Hey, Chris, it's uh, great to talk to you, sir. I hope you're doing well. Welcome back into the game in T-Town. Hey, Ryan. Yeah, it's good to be with you guys. Hey, just about, uh, and I know spring practice already started at some places, but uh, in Tuscaloosa, we're only 18 days away, and this quarterback conversation is going to be a big one. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think all over the country, that's what people are probably going to be talking about, is is what's, you know, how's it going to shake out a quarterback in Alabama? And we know what happened last year. You know, Jalen Hurst got into the championship game. Um, I still 26-2 and as a starter. Uh, but Tua Tonga Vailoa came in and um, won it in the second half against Georgia. You know, look, looking like a million dollars. I, listen, Nick Saban's smart enough. A, that he's not going to tip his hand on what he's going to do, and I don't really think he knows yet. I mean, everybody's just a. I love how people seem to think they know more than the coaches, as if they've been at practice all day, every day. Clearly, Tua can sling it, all right? Um, but. Why would you at this point designate that this guy's a starter, this guy's one A, or this guy's one B? He's going to spring, let him compete, see who it is. I mean, it's just like you told me yesterday. You can't fool a player. Players know who the best guy is, um, and then let it play out. And yeah, everybody wants to know well, one of them's probably not going to stay, or one of them's going to leave, perhaps. But why make that again, Ryan? Why make that designation right now when you haven't even started spring ball? Well, do you feel that, obviously, part of this is a salesman pitch? I mean, as Nick Saban uh, wants to sell, that there is a big quarterback competition, or do you really authentically believe that there is a knockout, dragout competition upon us in eight days, 18 days? No, I, no, I definitely think there'll be a competition. I mean, we, we, the only time we saw two was the second half. The grand half was a big stage. He played great. But remember, think about how quick, how thin the, the margin is between – what he did and what he didn't do. I mean, the first, I think his first series went three and out. You know, if if that next series, the next series doesn't go as well as it did, you know, do they go back to Jalen? So, yeah, you know, I definitely think there's going to be a competition because the cream's going to rise to the top. They both are kids that have won and done good things on big stages, you know, and just like Nick said, you know, they, they never get to the championship game without Jalen Hurts. And you talk to other opposing defensive coordinators, and they talk about how difficult Hurts was to defend. And clearly, he struggled to throw the ball at times. He was not consistent throwing the ball down the field. I think part of it was he's such a perfectionist that he does not want to throw interceptions. And that's the thing I think that coaches like Nick Saban think about, maybe fans and those in the media don't put as much stock in it. Jalen did not turn the football over. I think there's more of a – Tua will have more, more of a propensity to maybe turn it over. Jalen didn't, and, and, and football is still very much a complimentary thing, especially when you're Alabama. You recruit the caliber of players they do on defense. Uh, what's going to beat Alabama is if you turn the football over a lot and give defense or give opposing offense a short field. So it all sort of fits together, and certainly with Jalen's ability to create, that was a big part of it. But, no, I, I think they're definitely going to compete, and I think, as, as Nick told me yesterday, uh, the best guy's going to play. And, and – and that will probably be pretty apparent by the end of the spring, if not by the end of the spring, as they get into the preseason. Remember, what year was it that they played McCarron and Phillips then? 2011. The first, yeah, the first two, three games, and sort of when it sort itself out, and then McCarron and A.J. Swift took the, took the reins and was the guy the rest of the year. I'm not saying we're going to get to that point, but I think that, well, I don't think I know, I haven't, haven't talked with him, I don't think he's in any rush to decide who's the quarterback right now, nor, nor should he be. Why, why be in a rush to say this is the guy when you want to see him compete you know, and how both of them fare over these next couple of months and into the summer? Going back, and I, I've said it multiple times, I think we're going to see a different Jay on Hurts. At times I thought, and, and maybe this was the hesitation, and maybe I misjudged it, but I said it was probably lack of – that I thought he lost some of his confidence at the back end of the season. Uh, and that's just judging from my perspective. And I think we're going to see a different type J1 Hurts. Are you picking up on that, that maybe we'll see a guy that will now be willing to take some of those chances, knowing that he's in a in a quarterback competition battle? Well, I mean, I think measure chances. I mean, I don't, I don't think any coach wants you know, a quarterback to take quote-unquote chances. But I think, yes, I think he's, you know, and again, talking to Nick and being around football complex yesterday, I think everybody expects him to be ready to go. And ready to compete, and but that's Ryan. That's a good thing. What 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 has separated Alabama? You ran that program. You covered it for a long time. 
What has separated Alabama since Saban's been there? Competition at every position. At every position. Competition. Competition. Incredible competition on the practice field across the board. And we were talking about that yesterday, and and Nick was very clear. He said, I don't think quarterbacks should be any different. So you recruit the right right guys, and they spend a lot of time and and have got a long track record of bringing guys into the program who aren't afraid of competition. And – Understand when they come to Alabama, you know, nothing's going to be handed to you. You go out and earn it. You go out and win the job. I think both of those guys, Tua and Jalen, get that. And I think they'll push each other and make each other better. Now, how will it all shake out? Will it transfer? You know, are they, is Alabama clearly better with Tua's ability to throw the football? All that's going to play out, you know. But right now, why sort of get in front of that and not let it play out and say, well, this is the guy, this is the 1A, this is 1B. I think that's what Nick's doing. He said, listen, we're going to let him compete. We know, the players know, by the time spring practice ends in April, I think they'll have a better idea. I still, I'm still not sure he's going to come out in the spring and say, this is my guy. I think you're 100% correct. I think, and, and I'm sure part of that is, obviously, they don't want to lose one of these guys. And, and if there is a no. big separation, they they're going to maybe, sure maybe lose one of those guys. Yeah. And, and, you know, he told me yesterday, and I think this needs to be, I need to, to just specify. He didn't say that they're planning on playing two guys. He did not say that. What he said was that he's not ruling out or he is not against the idea of finding a role for both of them if they both prove and play, in his words, winning football. Now, what would that be? Would it be a package here and there? I don't know. Um, that's a pretty broad statement. But I think he feels like that he's seen both of them on big stages, both of them in – Big time situations now has a good idea and a good feeling that they both get it done. They're going to find out even more as they go forward in the spring and then sort of make that determination from there. We try to feature you about once a month, and we love your insight that you're able to provide. You're, you know, have a, obviously a, a great media a relationship with Nick Saban, great, great insight. Obviously, you built trust over the years. And, and a lot of things, when Nick continues to travel up in uh, years, uh, it becomes a question. Uh, and we hear it from outside. We have recruiting analysts on that explain to us that it's being used against him on the recruiting trail. You put out a tweet, Nick Saban might be 66, but he loves the grind as much as he ever did. Uh, talk about that, because I think that gives us more insight uh, into this grinder that we know of, of Nick Saban. Yeah, well, that's just, that's just the way he's wired, Ryan. I mean, he, that's, whether he's 36 or 76, but, you know, that's never going to change. And... You know, he wants to be doing something. He wants to be involved. And, you know, some coaches, as they get up in age, are more of a CEO. You know, and all the other coaches do, you know, most of the heavy lifting. Well, he makes his hard on his coaches now as the other one. You know, he told me yesterday he thinks he's more patient in a lot of areas. But, you know, he hasn't slowed down at all. And he loves what he does. He loves recruiting. He loves evaluating. He loves going on the road. He loves going on the road and, and visiting the kids. He loves being a part of their fourth quarter program. He loves coaching. He loves being in the drill. I mean, if you go out watching practice, I mean, he's throwing balls to the corners and their defensive back drills. I just don't think he, in his mind, can really envision him doing anything but that. And as long as he's able to do it at a high level, as long as he's healthy, as long as there's no upheaval administratively at Alabama, University of Alabama, I, I don't see him. Step away anytime soon. Why would he? He's winning at a high level. He's won with different staffs. You know, the staff's going to be almost completely new this year. Uh, they continue to develop players. The standard doesn't change there. He's got the, the quote unquote stroke. I think probably more control than any other head coach in college football. Um, he loves doing it. So I, I'm sure people will use his age against him. They did the same thing with Spurrier. They did the same thing with a lot of coaches as they got on up in age. You know, but Nick's about as young as 66 as you get. I mean, he, he really is. He's in great shape. He's always going. I um, I don't see him stepping away anytime soon. Now everybody says, well, what, what, what's soon? Two or three years, five or six years, ten years? I don't know. I'd be very surprised if, if he's not still coaching this class that they brought in, this, this, this freshman class that they just finished you know, putting the, the wraps on. That he's not still coaching those guys when they're finished, you know, when they're seniors and juniors. I think he's, I don't think he thinks much about it, honestly. 
until people to ask him about it. People like me, others in the media, and when he hears about on the recruiting trail, you know, if kids quiz him about it because they've heard from other rival recruiters. Uh, but in his mind, you know, he's, he's going to keep doing this for, for a while. Chris, Nick Saban told us the day after the championship game on that morning that he was going to spend some time, and it may have been your colleague, Alice Scarborough, that asked him, uh, at, at what point do you, have you had a chance to reflect on what you've been able to accomplish? And he, he followed it up that right now that's not important to him, but he said, I plan to really reflect on that. Do you think he's done that? Has he had a, maybe have a little bit of time to understand the historical significance of that win and, and where he's going to obviously be the undisputed champion as the greatest coach of all time? You know, I just don't think he thinks in those terms. You, I think he looks at it more – I mean, when you talk to him about what's happened in the past, I mean, he's not a big rearview mirror guy. Sure. I don't think there's going to be rearview mirrors in Nick's, in Nick's life. He talks more in terms of kids that have come through and done well, either playing pro football or going on in their life, have done well. Maybe kids that were headed down the wrong path. You know, and he talks a lot about change in behavior that were why they, when they got him or why he was there, and then kids that were able to turn around. You know, it makes something a lot. I think that's what, when he talks about being, yeah, he understands he's won a ton of games and a lot of championships. He realizes that. You know, he's as competitive as anybody. But I really don't think he's, he sits down and thinks about, well, if I win two more national championships, I pass this guy. If I win three more, I, I put so much distance between me and the next guy that no one's ever going to catch me. That's just not the way he's wired. You know, he's thinking about the next recruiting class, the next practice, the next fourth quarter conditioning drill, um, the next staff meeting with his coaches because he's going to get on to him about something he didn't like in the previous practice. Uh, he just that's, – that's the way he thinks and that's the way he wired. He just – he just doesn't spend a lot of time, even all the years I've known him and the conversations we've had, talking about, you know, God, we won X amount of games or, boy, you know, we won this many championships in this many years. I mean, if you bring that up, you know, he'll talk about it a little bit, but he's certainly a lot more tuned in to what's next, the next challenge. And as, as he says, every team, every year is different. And I think that's the way he genuinely approaches it going forward. And it's just um, it's just not something he spends as much time thinking about, really what, what he's accomplished to this point. Chris, how impressed are you with the staff that he's put together? Well, it's the youngest staff he's ever had. So, Well, at Alabama, at least. Uh, really good, strong recruiting staff. Some guys, and he really likes the golden guy. You know, young guy. Uh, be really involved in the defense. Uh, you know, I know. I think Mike Locksley taking over the offense. Mike's got a great relationship with both the quarterbacks. The guys in the offense in that offensive room really relate well to Mike. Um, but I think across the board, I, I really like the special teams coach Jeff Bank. I think that he's a guy that will come in there and make. A real difference with their special team. You know, he's talked to everybody he's worked with him. He's played under him. They got nothing but good things to say about it. You know, it's new. There's a lot of faces, a lot of faces in new roles. I think the, I think this is right, Ryan. The 15 staff when they won a championship at 15. I don't think there's anybody that was on that staff that's in the same role now, except for Scott Cochran. And I tell you what, I know Scott Cochran's not a position coach, but you talk about a guy that sets the tone and has helped sort of feed into the kind of culture there that Nick Saban wants. Cochran's is valuable as anybody, along with maybe he didn't get the play that Scott Cochran does, but their trainer, Jeff Allen, is terrific. I mean, the work he does, the way he relates to players, and, and the relationship, you find this all the time in college football. When the strength coach and the trainer have a great working relationship, you really got something. And those two guys do, Allen and Cochran. They work well together. They get each other. And I think that, to me, is one of the untold stories about success there is that sort of triumvirate. You talk about Saban, Allen, and Cochran, how long they've been together, how well they work together, and how they all in complete concert with how to do it and what they want to do.